Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. We've got a good turnout. Um, I want to say thank you to our speakers and our panellists, who you'll meet during the course of the morning. Um, we will have late comers because I gather there have been uh, travel difficulties and Waterloo and all sorts of things. So uh, you have to bear with people coming in and out, or in, hopefully not out. Um, I'm going to hand over now to um, Philip Howard, who's going to do a bit of scene setting, and then um, Michelle, and onwards with the rest of the programme. So enjoy the day, and I'll be speaking with you later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I was one of those people who almost didn't make it as I was st stuck outside Waterloo for about 40 minutes. Um, okay, so um, I have many roles, but um, one of the roles that I do um, wear is um, I work for NHS Improvement as one of the um, National Antimicrobial Resistant Project Leads. And so I think this fits in quite nicely with some of the work that we're doing. So we've got a really exciting sort of program sort of on here. So the plan is we're going to run through the talks this morning and then we're going to um, take coffee um, sort of in this room afterwards and then we're going to have a panel discussion. So any questions you've got for the speakers, we're actually going to pick them up during the panel um, sort of session on there. So make a note of what you're going to be talking about. Speakers, I'm going to keep you to time because we start a little late. Um, and then... Um, I just remind you about phones. So if you've got a phone on and you need to be contacted, put on to vibrate, please, or, or turn it off, preferably on there. Um, there isn't any Twitter hashtags for the day, but you can make one up if you want to, if you're into those um, type of things. I don't think we're expecting a fire alarm, no. And if you haven't discovered where the loos are already, out of the door, turn right and they're down the stairs. Okay. So I'm just going to set the scene um, for us at the moment. So... We know the NHS is pretty good at um, um, identifying problems with healthcare acquired infections, setting, um, and we'll choose our words carefully, uh, quality improvement schemes in place to achieve what um, needs to be achieved. And certainly we've seen year on year decreases in Clostridium difficile infection uh, and MRSA infection. They've both gone down by about 80 odd percent on there. But if you look at this graph at the top at the moment, we've still got a big problem. We've got a problem overall with Staph aureus infections, which are mainly related to the devices. But more worryingly, we've got a big problem with E. coli bloodstream infections, which are increasing year on year. Many of you may have heard of Jim O'Neill. Um, so David Cameron appointed him. Um, one of the very sensible things um, David Cameron did, and he ended up doing an AMR review um, on behalf of the G7 countries and came up with some really fast, snappy sort of reports on there, which in one of them certainly included diagnostics. And then he put his final report out, and the government did its response in September last year about it, and they came up in the human health for three real areas. One, they were going to reduce inappropriate antibiotic prescribing by 50% by the year 2021, and they were going to reduce healthcare associated grand negative bloodstream infections in England by 50% by the same time. And that's pretty challenging, I think. Um, and then, starting on the 23rd of October, if you watch telly, listen to the radio, you'll hear the public health uh, campaign about keep antibiotics sort of working. So, this fits in with our sort of theme around um, UTIs. So, E. coli bacteremia. Um, Back in 2015-16, we know the overall rate was um, 70 people out of 100,000 will require an E. coli bacteremia. And you can see the risks get uh, larger and larger amongst the elderly. And we know we've got an ageing sort of population um, on there. We have some clear guidelines from Public Health England on um, how to take appropriate sort of um, urine sort of specimens. This happens to be the one for the under 65s. And some very clear guidance for the over 65s, those who are cathetered, um, and also we've got it for sort of children. And at the moment, NICE are actually pulling together some common infection guidelines. And so later on this year, we will actually have a um, guideline on urinary tract infection. So that will be coming out sometime soon. So why do we need a, a diagnostic standard? Well, we know that almost 50% of gram-negative bloodstream infections um, are from a urinary source, and we know the mortality rate is around about sort of 20% 20, uh, 20 at uh, one month, and it increases uh, the older you get. 
from some freedom of information um, um, requests out there, and before you start booing, they do come up with some useful stuff. We know that 22.5% of urine specimens delivered nationally every year are unreliable. And so it's estimated that um, just over 14.5 million patients cannot be diagnosed or treated from urine specimen leading to inadequate treatment and increasing costs. And this is why um, we do have a PHE UK standard for microbiology investigation um, of urine. And we need accurate urine specimens to make this happen. And one of the bits I thought I'd flag up to really reinforce that, this is uh, an NIHR uh, study that Alistair Hay and um, the team over in Bristol did. And it was all about diagnostic UTIs in young children. And one of the bits that they actually came up with was saying, instead of using dipsticks, actually, even in young children, we can actually reliably use, um, take uh, urine samples and capture them thereof. And it's actually a better value for money and we get a um, lot less uh, contamination on there. And he's developed some algorithms on when I should actually take a, a urine sample and then how I should give sort of treatment. So there's lots of work going on there at the moment. And then a shameless self-plug. So one of the bits we've been trying to do as part of the AMR strategy, um, we've set up a Slack community. Not quite the word I would have done it, but it's Slack is an app that you can find on your phones. Um, and it's a community, and it's based around to dip or not to dip. And it's having this real sort of big discussion about how we can improve the care of patients in care homes, trying to not over-diagnose. So if you're interested in some of that, go and join the community and join in. And this was just some work that was developed in Nottingham by Annie Joseph, who's a microbiology consultant there, about obtaining urine samples sort of well. So that was really just trying to set the sort of the intro. So I will then just hand over to our first two speakers, um, who are Michelle G uh, and Michael um, Adam, Adam Chuck. And if I can just bring this up. And you'll have seen their um, sort of uh, CVs um, within the thing. And they're going to talk to us about the midstream um, urine in obstetrics. Over to you. Mm -hmm. Right, good morning everyone. Um, basically, quick introduction, my name is Michael Adamczyk and I'm currently an SD4 in obstetrics and gynaecology, um, training in the southern part of England in Kent, Surrey and Sussex Deanery. Um, let, for those of you who don't know our training system, SD4 basically means that I'm right in the middle of my training in obstetrics. Let me introduce you to the team today. I've got Dr. Jai, who is Hi. in a couple of days going to be an SD2 trainee. And as myself, Michelle is part of the Kent Surrey and Sussex Deanery, and we are both working in Royal Surrey County Hospital. Dr. Karen Martin, unfortunately, um, couldn't be here with us today, but she's a consultant obstetrician and gynecologist at the Royal Surrey and the end, uh, founder of Dr. Martin's medical helpline. So today I'm going to speak to you, um, sort of I presented a couple of slides in regardless to midstream urine collection and the importance of it in pregnancy and obstetrics. And Michelle eventually will speak about an audit that we did and a research or sort of a study that we're currently running in Guildford uh, using a busy device. Bit of epidemiology. Um, so 20% of all females, regardless of race, will, will have at some point of their life a UTI. There's obviously a much higher incidence of that in pregnancy, and that's mainly because of various physiological changes and anatomical changes that happen in pregnancy. Kidneys, um, in pregnant females, kidneys are actually much larger than in non-pregnant individuals. Because of progesterone, everything really gets a bit more swollen, and let's not forget the gravid uterus that compacts on the on the bladder and that can cause also sort of swelling of a urinary tract all the way up to the kidneys. Asymptomatic bacteria can account to 2.5% of all pregnancies, which is um, quite a valid point. Um, so what are the implications of it in pregnancy? Um, this, if we have a symptomatic UTI that we haven't picked up in the beginning of the pregnancy, that can progress easily to final nephritis, which is ascending infection from the bottom towards the kidneys and eventually um, presents as kidney infection. That can also progress into urosepsis, which is a systemic 
infection and potentially can be fatal to both mum or the fetus. Um, of significance, obviously, importance to mums is increased risk of preterm births. And we know that 40% of all preterm births have, uh, are associated with lower sort of pelvic infection. Most of them are UTIs, bacterial vaginosis, and gonococcal cervicitis. So what is our current practice at the moment um, in regards to pregnancy and how do we test those women? All pregnant patients should have an MSU send at the booking regardless of urine dipstick. So we basically test everyone for symptomatic UTI and that's usually done at 12 weeks of gestation. It can be done at a midwife appointment, sort of in the outside community, in a hospital, by a GP or in an antenatal clinic. Thereafter, all urine dips are, that are positive for nitrates or local sites are sent for MSU for microbiology and culture. And that yet again, every time a patient comes to a hospital or is seen sort of or whenever they're seen in community, we will always dip, your, dip the urine to see what it shows. Women are advised to produce an MSU using conventional methods. Now that's quite an important point on the presentation as well. I'm pretty sure everyone in the, what does MSU really stands for? It's called midstream urine. That means that only the sort of, that we need to catch the midstream of that urine and the first five to 10 moles needs to be disposed. And I'm sure everyone here can appreciate the difficulty of urinating into a small tube and the contam contamination that then can cause actually. Um, antibiotics um, should only be given once MSU is sent um, because otherwise we might get uh, false negative readings and culture should be chased which is another important point because we obstetrics is a sort of, sort of a shared um, responsibility for the patient with the midwives gps etc sometimes those cultures can be missed um, it's important to chase them at times we have to change or stop antibiotics and it's a it's a really important uh, point and um, what sort of nice suggests is that we should be sending another msc after completions of antibiotics um, I don't think that the last point is, is said by NICE, and as a physician I know not many people actually do that. A um, bit of background information, so we are based in Royal Surrey County Hospital. Um, we've got around 3,200 births deliveries per year. Um, we sent around 340 MSU samples per month for obstetrics only. Now that number is significantly higher for gynecology. For a gynecology population, that comes to about 1,300. Um, including booking samples, we sent 74 MSUs based on dipsticks results, and that comes up to, to around 888 MSUs per year based on positive urine dipsticks at a cost of seven, six, seven pounds 62. Now Michelle is going to speak to you about, um, about the audit that we did. And she's also going to speak about the study that we're currently running. Hello. I'll try and keep it short because there's a lot of numbers. So moving on to the next slide. So we did um, a retrospective audit. And what we looked at was 100 women who delivered most recently at Royal Surrey County. Um, we examined the, the criteria would be that they had to have booked at Royal Surrey. So we caught the entirety of their antenatal care. And then continued the antenatal care, didn't switch um, care providers and then end up delivering at Royal Surrey. Um, the method was quite simple. We did note retrieval and we examined a number of variables, including the number of MSUs sent in, to in the total pregnancy, the number of MSUs that were sent appropriately. That's a point that we'll labour on a bit later on. And then also the positive culture rate, as well as antibiotics administered uh, against our local policy and the contamination rate. So order results, for these 100 women that were examined, the total number of urine dips analysed was 1,141, which is quite a lot. That averages out to about 11.4 per pregnancy. Of these, 227 MSUs were sent. Now, as Michael has alluded to earlier, um, we all sent a booking MSU, regardless of urine dip results. So excluding that, we would have 132 purely sent based on the urine dipstick test alone. Now, looking at the, examining the um, notes, I can see that actually 
we meant to have sent 132 based on a positive dipstick, but if you examine it closely, 21, so that equates to 15.9% were sent inappropriately. And that was either sent because there was protein or blood in the urine, um, and it's lack of education, it's lack of following local guidelines, and they were sent wrongly, and you know, it, it's a waste of money. So that's 672 samples, if we extrapolate the data from our initial audit findings, costing us north of £5,000 a year at our trust. And we are not a big obstetric trust. Examining the data further, of the 227 MSU sent, including the booking ones, we had a 4% positive culture rate. They grew a variety of bugs. Uh, the most common, as you would all know, would be E. coli. We also had a mixture of Enterococcus as well. Now, it was almost impossible to differentiate which of these positive culture rates arose from booking MSUs. So looking at literature now, we know that the average is 2 to 7% for asymptomatic bacteria picked up from booking MSUs. So to extrapolate it statistically, we have estimated and um, postulated that actually perhaps out of the nine, five were false positive dip tests and actually four were true um, asymptomatic bacteria. That means actually we are having a very extremely, extremely high false positive dip test rate, which leads on to us sending unnecessary MSUs. And that is costing our trust, our relatively small trust in the grand scheme of things, north of £25,000 a year on MSUs alone. That is not including the cost of the antibiotics that we're giving. So that is a big number, big, big number. And that was something that we hadn't ed estimated before we carried out the audit. So it's a surprising finding, actually. Um, talking about the contamination side of things, um, We've come to conclude that there are actually two different types of contamination that we're dealing with at the moment. There is the contamination from the dipstick alone, then there is the contamination defined by the laboratory when it's sent for an MSU, which is the presence of epithelial cells or mixed growth. Now, out of the 227, 6.7% were contaminated. Looking purely at that, that's costing the trust yet another £2,000 a year. It is unknown, it's really difficult to, to tell from the retrospective audit whether antibiotics were administered appropriately. Quite a lot of the time it's not documented, quite a lot of time they were given and there's no evidence. They assume that it's given, so we can only assume that guidelines were followed. Now I just want to give you a little bit of an information on the current study that's ongoing at Guildford Hospital. Um, it is based in our antenatal aspect of obstetrics, so antenatal clinic and the antenatal ward. Mm -hmm. And we are looking at a, study, a sample size of 100 people. Um, the conclusion criteria is quite simple. You have to be pregnant, um, an adult, or gestations are welcome. And those that are testing positive for nitrites and leukocytes, because every woman that comes in through our doors who is seeing us will get a urine dipstick test. So it's not actually adding to our workload, which is quite nice. The exclusion criteria we have made was um, excluding those with indwelling catheters because obviously they are a different cohort with a significantly higher risk of infections anyway. And it does not reflect the general obstetric population. So sampling method, all patients that fit the criteria attending antenatal clinic or ward are given a leaflet and a PZ device. Uh, obviously, they have the option to opt in or opt out. Um, we also have a feedback questionnaire, which includes the foreign variables, a hospital number as the only identifying factor. Um, that is because we need to chase up the results of the MSU and we need to find some sort of identifying factor. Uh, gestation as well, urine dipstick test result, that is a measure out of our current service provision to also examine whether actually people are sending them appropriately. As you can tell from my previous slide, we are there is a small proportion of people that are sending MSUs inappropriately because they don't understand what it means and they're sending it based on a positive protein. They may get confused with a PCR, which we often look at in preeclampsia. Um, we also wanted to examine the presence of urinary symptoms and obviously any treatment with antibiotics seven days prior because that will, can cause a false negative on the test. And also any antibiotics that were administered on the day. These are very preliminary results. We've only got 22% um, of the study completed at the moment, but it is ongoing and we're trying very, very hard. As of last night, there's a 5% positive rate, uh, culture rate, and that was E. coli, and it was treated appropriately. There was a 5% contamination rate. Now, from the retrospective audit data, I am quite confident to say that as the sample size grows bigger, 
this number will fall exponentially. That is my hypothesis anyway, otherwise I'll be disproving myself. Um, and actually I'm quite pleased to see that 72% found the device quite useful, uh, user-friendly, and will use the device again. Um, so it's a work in progress. Um, there's obviously quite a lot of limitations to doing a study. Um, for us, we have a very high workload with a high uh, bank staff that rotate around every day. So to educate and inform and engage all the staff is almost impossible. You, you, get, you catch them at induction and that, that's it. And myself and Michael, unfortunately, cannot be there 24-7. So it is proving a little bit tough, but we are persevering. It's also quite a lengthy time to recruit patients because if we lack education of the staff, then the patients don't engage. So we're working on that at the moment. Um, the comment about patients report unexpected urine flow. Um, I've noticed that in the initial couple of patients, they reported that they didn't expect urine to come out. In their minds, they feel the device is meant to collect all the wee. And I was like, well, you're not going to only wee 10 mils, you will wee more. It is normal for it to discard the first couple of mils. So again, it's about educating our staff and educating our patients. And I found myself when I've been doing one-to-one -one with the patients, they've had no issues, so long as you warn them. A lot of the patients also don't read the packet or the leaflet, which I'm not sure I can do much about, but I can only encourage them to. And um, also, um, we have been, I've actually had a discussion, um, but um, our microbiology only produces, um, only processes samples that are um, sent in boric acid tubes, which are commonly the red tops. Um, we've been given the white tops, but I think that can be easily rectified. I understand boric acid is because they need to maintain the microbiology because of the length of time it takes to transport to the lab and they didn't want overgrowth. So, conclusion. There's a few take-home messages. There's definitely potential for further use of PZ in collecting future obstetric MSUs. We were a huge population for using MSUs and sending them off. And it's so important for us um, because it's impact on baby and mother. Um, and from the unexpected data, the result that we found from the audit, which is the fact that we're wasting £26,000 a month, but, uh, a year, by sending inappropriate MSUs, there's possibly scope for using the PZ from the get-go to collect it in a normal urine sample and then dip it and then send it off as an MSU, reducing contamination rates further. That is obviously another um, whole lot of research in itself, but that's something, certainly something we've discovered from the retrospective audit. Um, and uh, I hope I didn't talk too fast and bore you with the numbers, um, but we uh, look forward to finishing the study and we are actually aiming to present it at the uh, World Congress for Obstetrics and Gynaecology in Singapore next year, hopefully. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. An excellent start. Sorry, is there, is there any, when can we ask questions? Uh, I said um, we're going to do it after coffee. We're going to take all the questions there. So if you've got any questions, write them down so you don't forget them. Um, okay, so we're going to move straight on next to um, a talk on contamination rates in urine a quality improvement audit. Um, Professor Frank Chinegwundo uh, is a consultant urologist at Bard's Health, and he's going to talk to us next. Thank you very much. Escape. There we go. And Frank. Oh, there we are. Don't know how you get rid of that. It's in there. Oh. <laughs> this is your presentation, yeah? Yes. <coughs> right, good morning, everyone. Um, this follows on nicely from the uh, previous talk. Um, what, what I'm going to do is present some early data on a study that we did at, uh, at the Royal London, looking at contamination rates in urine collections. And one of the reasons I got interested in, 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 this, um, in this whole subject area was, in fact, a similar reason to uh, uh, Vincent Forte, who, who invented the device. When I was speaking to, uh, to Vincent, he was telling me that about a, uh, this woman that came to him with a urine sample, but urine had leaked all over the outside, and she was very embarrassed having to kind of wash it down before handing it, handing it to him. And of course, because it's wet, you can't write on a label. And so when Vince shared this story uh, with me, I thought, I've also had that experience. 
it's actually very difficult, um, particularly <coughs> if you're um, a woman, to pee into one of those tiny little pots without getting urine all over it. So the, con so the consequences of that is that often the, the lady is not told that it's the midstream that's required. They're just given the pots and say, do a urine sample, which is why we get such high contamination rates, as I'll show you. The other, conse the other consequence of the, of the difficulty in collecting the urine samples is that, um, like on our ward, for example, I just saw this last week, um, a lady given um, one of those kidney dishes to pee into, and then the nurse would then decant it into the appropriate uh, container, which introduces all, all, all kinds of errors. So I became interested in this area of, is there a better way of, of, of collecting um, urine samples? So, so the, idea, the idea was to um, uh, collect 200 um, uh, samples um, from adult patients coming to our urology clinic, and, and, for, and the lab would tell us what the contamination rate was and compare historical data with the contamination rates used with the PZ device. So um, the aim was to get 200. So far, we've got 66 um, um, uh, samples to look at. So what the lab told us, what do they uh, count as uh, contamination? Um, they they uh, classify contamination as scanty mixed growth, moderate mixed growth, or a heavy mixed growth. And what we want to know as, um, as urologists is, well, is either there's no growth, and we can be sure that there's no growth, or there's a pure culture growth. So when we see scanty mixed growth, moderate mixed growth, we don't know whether um, that uh, patient has got a urine infection or not, and we regard those as contamination. That often leads us to have to repeat the uh, urine, urine sample. So the device, I think some of you may have seen this um, um, outside. It's quite an ingenious way of collecting the, mid, the midstream um, urine. One thing that appealed to me very much was the, the whole business of hygiene. Um, every time I collected one of those urine pots from a patient, I'm then going to have to wash my hands and get another sticker to put, to put over the bottle. So I was very keen on the, on the fact that it's, it's more hygienic. The uh, feedback we got from the healthcare professionals was we're getting less mixed growth, therefore uh, repeating less urine samples. And also, because you can attach the, the, uh, the, the, the bottle that the microbiology lab require to put on the analyzer, it's, uh, it avoids um, decanting. The feedback from, from the patients was that they were very pleased not to get urine all over their, all, all the, all over their hands. Um, they were pleased that they didn't have to repeat the urine collection. On the other hand, some of the patients, particularly the more old, uh, older patients, found attaching the collection bottle to the device somewhat fiddly. And similar to, uh, to our previous speakers, you do have to instruct the patients how to use the device. So if you don't do that, you end up with a situation, for example, one of the men, when he peed into it, he didn't appreciate that the first bit was going to go, into, uh, was going to go out the bottom. So he found it going over, over his legs and, was, uh, <laughs> and complained, about, complained about that. So I had to make sure that all the nurses in the, in the clinic gave the appropriate instructions as to how to use the device. So I emphasize these are early results it's a small sample size of 66 um, patients uh, to date. But even at this early stage, we can appreciate that from the historical data on, on the left, where the lab were telling us there was a 17.3 uh, contamination rate. And although it, it's, it's small numbers, with, with the PC device, this, this has gone down to just over 1.5%. And I'm sure when we complete the uh, 200 or even expand that, we will find a significant reduction in the contamination rate. Therefore, we can rely uh, better on what that midstream urine is telling us. And of course, at, you know, Bart's Health is the largest trust in the country. We have you know, thousands upon thousands, you know, 100,000 plus urine samples a year. So 17.5 um, or 17.3 <coughs> contamination rates historically is actually a lot of um, wasted activity, not to mention 
the, the expense. So some of the um, observations that I made from um, running, this, running this study, um, the first point is, 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 is very crucial. You, ha you have to explain to someone who hasn't used the device how to do it. You can't just hand it to them and hope that they'll read the instructions, which are clear enough. But uh, we have a lot of patients in, in East London who English isn't necessarily the first language. So you have to explain how to use a device. You have to explain, in common with the first speakers, that the first bit is going to go out of the bottom of the, of the device. Otherwise, they'll come to you with uh, an alarm. So we're happy that we can get the actual midstream uh, part of the, of the urine flow, which is the flow that, uh, which is the bit that you want to get. Um, the hygiene is important. You know, the toilets are cleaner. The nurses are, are, are happier without um, the, the soiling that they get on, on their fingers. So um, for the older patients, we, we open the package uh, for them and attach the bottle to it because they can find difficulty with that. So the uh, implications, I guess, are fairly um, evident. You know, if you're going to collect a biological sample, if you can collect the best sample you can, you're likely to get the uh, diagnosis right the first time. Of course, if you, get, if you make the right diagnosis, you reduce the um, uh, unnecessary use of um, antibiotics. It's an uh, easy device to use. It's, um, it's used in antenatal care, where particularly with the asymptomatic bacteria, you want to be able to detect that um, accurately. In terms of, of cost savings, one of the struggles that we've had at Bart's Health in trying to get this more widely adopted is the device, although it's relatively cheap at 87 pence, nonetheless it's 87 pence more than the hospital were paying, were paying before. And there are savings in terms of um, uh, reduced appointments, better um, diagnosis, less uh, uh, antibiotic use. But from the hospital's point of view, that those are kind of on costs that they don't necessarily um, see. So we are having um, a challenge in trying to get the, the trust to see the wider picture and not focus on, on, the, um, on the extra initial cost of the, um, of the device. So in conclusion, I think this device works well. I think you have to instruct the patients how to use it because they wouldn't know how to use it. Everyone's familiar with just peeing into, into a container, but uh, peeing into this device is a, little, uh, is a little different. They have to sit uh, well back over the toilet, otherwise the first bit of the urine is going to go over themselves. Um, you're gonna get less uh, repeat urine samples. It's more dignified with, that when, with this device. We didn't get any distressed patients saying that there was urine all over themselves or over, over, over their hands. We didn't have any embarrassed, embarrassed patients embarrassed to hand us the um, um, urine device. So I think that, you know, I think I found something that's going to uh, not, not only enable me to get a more accurate specimen, but to save a lot of the uh, em embarrassment, both from the, the patients and also the, the, the healthcare professional. And when we roll out this study, Unfortunately, my research registrar has uh, recently left, has, come, has got promoted, which is great for him, not so great for doing the study, but um, I'm hoping to recruit another research fellow to try and get us to uh, the, the 200, but I'm sure when we do that, we'll show that contamination rate is significantly different. Thank you. Okay, an excellent talk. Uh, we're starting to get a bit of a picture coming sort of through here. So we're going to change uh, track slightly. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, AMR. Um, about where we are in, the, um, in England at the moment and give you um, just a sort of quick overview. And also some new bits that um, has been made aware for public data. And so one of the beauties about the uh, AMR uh, strategy within the UK is transparency. So we're probably one of the very few countries in the world which actually is making all our data down to GP level actually open. And I would stress for you to go actually sort of look at this. So I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of um, 
uh, antimicrobial resistance and UTIs. So back in uh, 1928, when Fleming actually discovered penicillin um, uh, for the first time, um, we saw the mortality rate for infectious diseases almost drop to a quarter of what it was before. And it allowed us to start um, doing complicated surgery, so colorectal surgery, having patients in critical care and living, organ transplantation, looking after a premature sort of neonate, but also doing, giving fairly intensive chemotherapy. And if we lose effective antibiotics, we will actually lose most of those things. And if you go to southern Asia, to India and places like that, the people who are driving the battle against antimicrobial resistance are mainly the oncologists because they're seeing big problems on it. And it's estimated that antibiotics have added between 8 to 20 years um, of, of life. Fleming at the time warned us about antimicrobial resistance. And then Jim O'Neill again, he's did lots of good work, and he'd estimated that unless we start changing things now, by the year 2050, we'll see 10 million deaths a year, and that's one every three seconds. It will start to out sort of number deaths from cancer. How does antimicrobial resistance work? Well, the more you use, the more resistance you get is the bottom line. So this was some... Uh, uh, work that was presented at the G7 meet a couple of years ago, and this is basically a graph by country of consumption of antibiotics on the horizontal and on the vertical resistance, and it just happens to be streptococcus pneumoniae resistance penicillin, but you can place any drug bug combination um, sort of with this. Last year, uh, United Nations Green, this landmark declaration to rid the world of uh, drug resistant infections or super bugs, and they were going to report back in two years. It still makes me chuckle because they will not achieve it. It's about really plateauing where we are at the moment and rather is spreading further. Um, and just to point out, everyone sort of blames the uh, lower middle income countries, and you, this is just resistance rates uh, in E. coli, and you can see huge resistance to common antibiotics uh, in India uh, and in sort of South, um, South Africa. But actually, they use less antibiotics than we do. And the big challenges that they actually have there is because of hygiene and sanitation problems. You go to India, um, less than one in two people have access to a toilet over there. So that's the big problems that they have. And if you think that we're going to be happily sitting in, in planet Brexit and nobody's going to give us anything unpleasant, I'm afraid these aeroplanes we fly around the world, we bring back the bugs in our guts for where we visited. All of you have come through that door. Every one of you touch the door, and we just pass it from one person to the next. And some of you sit there with your hands in your mouths, and you'll be ingesting uh, the bugs as we speak. So who uses antibiotics uh, in the UK? Three quarters are in, um, in general practice, 10% or uh, 11% in hospital inpatients, 7% in outpatients, 5% in dentists. And this translates to one in three people have a course of antibiotics um, every year, and one in three people will be on an antibiotic at any one time in hospital. And if you stay in hospital for longer than two days, that is actually one in two patients are on antibiotic. So we're using lots and lots of antibiotics. And this is a graph of consumption over sort of time, and you can see it's been growing. And we have just slightly turned the corner in the last couple of years in there. We sit mid-table within Europe. We are improving slightly, but we sit mid-table. So we have a five-year strategy. Um, it covers um, surveillance of resistance and consumption. It's about improving pres uh, prescribing, improving infection prevention control, improving education training, public engagement, uh, getting better evidence, new drugs, vaccines, diagnostics, um, and strengthening international collaboration. Um, the next strategy, which comes after this one, uh, will be our national action plan, and it will be very much of the same. While we've made good progress, not a huge amount is going to change. I've already showed you about the AMR review, and it was really just to sort of flag up um, a couple of bits on here. So inappropriate prescribing, and we'll talk about it in a moment, and reducing gram-negative bloodstream infections. And so what is a definition of inappropriate prescribing? It's about prescribing antibiotic in the absence um, of a bacterial infection. And we've heard already about the failure to actually have samples sent to the lab and grow something that we can end up using. And so I think we see an awful lot of um, potential infections where there's no evidence because we can't get the tests right. 
It also includes using a broad spectrum antibiotic um, or even uh, an antibiotic prescription below uh, the recommended course length. And I'm sure we may discuss later on the BMJ paper about complete the course or not. So what's the problem with current UTI testing? Uh, most UTIs are not tested currently, with the exceptions of some of the ones we've heard already, pregnant females, males, children, suspected upper UTI treatment or treatment failures. And this means that the pictures I'm about to show you, and I'm going to focus on E. coli, probably overestimate, overestimate the resistance rates that we have. We don't have sentinel surveillance um, for urines currently uh, in England. So if we look at E. coli bloodstream resistance rates, um, the, all the coloured bars on there for all the common antibiotics we use are near enough the same height. We've not really seen an enormous change sort of going on here. But what we have seen an increase is actually the number of bloodstream infections. It's increased over that um, five-year period by almost a quarter. So we're seeing more and more. Um, and then we know real multidrug resistance is fairly small, and I'll show you on the next sort of um, slide um, and we think around about 50% of these have a urinary resource on. So this is what we're trying to prevent with appropriate prescribing. And this is just a graph of the various combinations to say, actually, we don't have a huge amount of resistance within E. coli at the moment. And within Klebsiella and pneumoniae, it's slightly higher. But it's, we haven't really reached the stages of, um, um, that we're seeing in southern India or the Far Eastern resistance. Mm -hmm. If we look at the resistance in uh, urinary isolates, so this is um, looking at over a million um, sort of isolates split between acute trusts or the community. Um, and if you actually sort of focus on the younger sort of the age group, so the under 12s and the sort of the young adults, you can see some sort of fairly low resistance rates in sort of most of them apart from trimethoprim. And one of the big problems we've got is trimethoprim still has probably high rates of resistance. 40 odd percent is probably a bit of, a, of an over sort of estimate sort of on there, but it's a, it's, it's a challenge for us. If we look about um, susceptibility again um, in that sort of uh, younger group on there by sort of organism, you can see again it's somewhat sort of similar with um, again 30 odd percent um, um, resistance with um, trimethoprim, but fairly low sort of elsewhere. This is some Welsh data because we don't have the UK data at the moment. And this is stratifying it by age. And you can see the resistance is higher the older you get. So the red line is, is sort of growing there. It's the over 80s. And the orange one is the, um, is the 65 to uh, 79s on there. And you can see there is resistance to trimethoprim going. So, and this is it broken down in and all the prescriptions we end up using um, over a 12-month sort of period. What we can see in here is we're using lots and lots of trimethoprim, despite it probably being resistance in these older sort of age groups, and we need to try and change it. And because of this, NHS England um, and supported by NHS Improvement has come up with a quality uh, premium. That's a quality improvement program. Uh, to actually improve prescribing. And so we're looking at a 10% reduction across the whole health economy of bloodstream infections, and then a 10% reduction in the ratio of trimethoprim to nitrofurantoin, which we know is fairly sensitive, and in the older patients, over 70, a 10% reduction in the number of trimethoprim prescriptions. If you've not looked at the PHEAMR fingertips, go and look at it. It's got everything you need to know about resistance, prescribing, healthcare acquiring infections. It's publicly available. You can look at a GP level, CCG level, or acute trust. Every first Tuesday of the month, it's updated with new data. And there's over 100 uh, different types of data um, on it. And this is just a graph by CCG. Plotting across the bottom is, um, is trimethoprim resistance. And you can see it's going... Um, up to 35% of nitrofurantoin uh, resistance um, going up the vertical axis, which is much sort of lower on there. So you can roughly see by your CCG or G your GP there. We can also have, this is, comes from, again, the ratio of trimethoprim to nitrofurantoin. And so I, I do my clinical work up in Leeds, and you can see we are following our guidelines reasonably well of using nitrofurantoin for most of the elements but there are still elements in Yorkshire where they've got a lot of work to do. This is some data, again, open data that anybody can look at um, from Presquip, and you can see that trimethoprim is going down and nitrofurantoin, which is our preference, is going up over the last year. So that's good news, hopefully, for improving patient outcomes. And then um, um, 
Public Health England have worked with NHS Improvement of really coming up with a toolkit to try and actually improve um, or prevent uh, E. coli bacteremias. And this is available for people to go and sort of use to try and reduce uh, mortality from this um, unfortunate infection. And then finally, there's some information for patients. So this is a UTI leaflet for patients. And this is all about something you can give to patients where you don't necessarily need to give them an antibiotic so they can have understanding and hopefully prevent things in the future. And again, this has been signed up by most of the Royal Colleges and organisations. And then purely to plug it again, if you didn't get it the first time, there is this uh, to dip or not to dip um, element um, on there, which hopefully will get... Um, a network of people around the country sharing best practice sort of on there. So in summary, um, uh, certainly AMR and UTI uh, bloodstream infections is probably stable, but the incidence is actually increasing. I think we've got an inc incomplete picture of true UTI resistance rates, uh, probably due to a lack of sentinel surveillance, but we do know that trimethoprim resistance is high, um, and we've got quality improvement schemes in place trying to reduce E. coli bloodstream infections and reduce the amount of trimethoprim uh, prescribing. So that was just an overview to see how it sort of fits into the bigger uh, picture. So I'm going to pass you over now to uh, Giovanna Forte, who is, um, um, you'll see from her fairly uh, impressive resume, anyone who can do TED Talks, I take my hat <laughs> off, um, who between, with her and her brother, have come up with this device. Are you going to talk about that? I am going to talk about that. I spend my life these days brandishing peasies, and today is no exception. This down here, and that there. Um, now, here we are. Um, the reason my brother, who is sitting at the front here, by the way, Dr. Vincent Forte, who is now retired, um, he, as everyone has, has heard, um, he rang me up one day and said, I've had yet another woman walk in and say, this tube must have been invented by a man, this process must have been invented by a man. And he also noticed he was seeing the same women for the same urinary tract infections that he thought he'd treated. Um, and came to the conclusion after doing some research and speaking to microbiology that accuracy actually mattered. Uh, and it does matter. And urine being one of the most common uh, diagnostic specimens has no standard. And that's what today is all about. Why is there no standard for the most common diagnostic process? Um, because it's, it's so routinely wrong. We did a, our Freedom of Information Act um, established that contamination rates vary between 0.3% and 70.3%. Now, can you imagine if that happened with a blood specimen? There would be an absolute outcry. And yet, it's still referred to as only urine. So the analysis fails, the diagnosis is delayed, patients have to be retested, and the cost in time and resource to the NHS is absolutely insane. Um, so Vincent came up with the idea that this simple funnel would, um, would solve the problem. Now, this did start out as a much simpler funnel, and I'm just going to uh, talk to you about how we've developed this. Vincent handmade these PZs. They were prototypes. Um, we, uh, it was, it, initially, we wanted PZ to be made out of a cornstarch polymer so that it was flushable, and we wanted it to be eco-friendly. Now, as it turned out, the polymers were too novel. We found this out after about um, 18 months. Um, so we couldn't use it. But for the purposes of this, we, we used the Plantic um, cornstarch polymer. It was a nice idea. Vincent made, the, made the, um, the prototypes, and we invited some people around. The aim was to establish exactly how good his idea was. Was it worth the time and trouble to, um, to spend um, developing it? Um, so... Vincent found uh, some volunteers from his surgery, and um, I, ha I had uh, what is now known as the Peasy Party at home. <laughs> I, inv I invited uh, five friends, and they brought people that I didn't know, so that there was uh, an element of you know, third party. I, didn't, I couldn't influence everybody. Um, the women turned up, some of them pregnant. They were a variety of ages, sizes, and everything. We, we took care to do that. Um, I gave them a lot of water, I gave them a peasy, I told them how to use it, and a questionnaire, and once they'd done that, I gave them champagne and canopy, and we had a nice time. Um, but we did collate all the information. We did do everything actually remarkably very, very well. We got up their consent, confidentiality, and everything else. We got all the paperwork that we were supposed to do. 
So they were briefed on, on the use of PZ. Now, as everybody has said, this is important, but then who's ever got on a bicycle and got it right first time? Not many people. Everything needs an explanation. And what we found is that the, the three, you screw the tube on, um, you, women hold this close to the body. If you don't hold it close to the body, you're going to get yourself wet. Um, men hold it over the loo. And the first 10 mil of urine comes through the bottom here, that sponge expands, acts like a cork, and it pushes the midstream into the tube. The excess comes out of a separate duct here. So this is engineered to work between 10 and 40 mils a second, uh, which is the, the minimum and maximum urine stre streams. Vincent says that if, if uh, it's less than 10%, you're probably on a catheter. Um, and if it's over 40 mils, um, 10 mils, 40 mils, uh, you're probably a horse. Um, <laughs> And, and actually, we are about to, we're looking at doing a, an equine peasy. I have to say, that's a whole other story. That'll be next year's forum. Um, anyway, after the trial, we interviewed all the patients on how to use it. Um, we dealt with everything very hygienically, but, and we got them to fill in their, their um, questionnaires. So what did we ask them? How easy was the device to use? They all found it very easy. They had been told how to do it. And we didn't have any graphic instructions in those days. Um, not many of them spilt any urine. Uh, hardly any urine went on the floor. Um, the bottles were very dry, and most of them would like to use it again. Um, now, when we did, we did a, a trial at the Pennine Trust, and there we reduced their contamination rate from 23% to 5 And one of the nurses, when we arrived to do this trial, he, he was quite shirty. You know, what are we doing this for now? You know, um, this is going to take time. By lunchtime, he walked in, he said, I have to apologize. I said, what for? He said, I wasn't very welcoming when you arrived because I, we're, you know, we're bored of having to try things out. Uh, but do you know, we have 75 years of experience between us and the nurse, nursing team here, and it's the first time we have never had to clean the toilet during urology clinic. Thank you very much. Um, so all the, the, the information, that there's, there's Wyman Chow. Yes, this is the, this is the, 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 the um, trial I'm talking about. Um, Wai Man Chow, was a, he's now retired, a leading consultant at the Pennine Trust, which is also one of the biggest in the country. Um, he wanted to try this out. He did pretty much what we did on our first usability study, wanted to find out about the contamination rates, how, how efficiently he was treating his patients. Um, this is the second PZ. Um, he had mainly... Now, this is the first time we realised that PZ was going to be used by men. Um, and there was a slightly higher contamination rate in men. It was 7.5. With women, it was 3.5. Um, and we, we worked out what the problem was. Um, the, the results were, were very successful. Um, they looked at all the aspects that we've been talking about, the hygiene, the wet bottle, and so forth. And, and you can see the results there. Um, very accurate, very good. So everyone was very pleased with that. Um, the results there... Um, again, the, all the results that we've had throughout the usability studies we've done, they all chime. They're all very similar. Um, you do need the right first-time instructions. Um, you, you don't get very much spillage. You get a dry bottle. But most importantly, you get the accurate midstream. Now, we've heard what the implications of that mean. Um, and it is important. It's important to treat your patient first time. No one wants to be um, in pain longer than they have to be. So this published abstract was... Um, was delivered at two, two international congresses, which we're very happy about. Uh, the most recent study from the NHS National Institute for Health Research, um, I was a little nervous about this because I had no influence on, on training the staff or, or anything else. It just had to happen. And actually, it was probably the most successful one we've had to date. Um, we provided 20 PZs, so not a, not a big cohort of patients. Um, but they, um, they received no, no specific instruction. They were just given the pack. And this was the big test for me. Were our graphics going to work? And yes, they did work. Um, our packaging does need a little bit of um, uh, improvement. It's quite difficult to open. But otherwise, as you can see from this, the um, majority of people found the sample easy to collect. It was hygienic. It was clean. It was, and and they, would, um, they would like to use it again in the future. So... We were very, very happy with this. Now, as we've gone through the years, we've, we've had a, um, a policy of continuous improvement. We ask questions. We find out how things can be improved. Um, and the instructions were one of them. The first load of instructions were not 
uh, detailed enough, and obviously they didn't include uh, an instruction for men, uh, which we included in the second one. So uh, it's a few, about three years ago, we commissioned this new pack, which w we had a focus group on the first kit, first pack, how does that work, is that okay? We took all the feedback, redesigned this, did another focus group, uh, and then put in some improvements. So we know, and we also know that if someone doesn't have English as a first language, um, they can work, work out what to do. So that's also quite handy. The Evolution product ev design, the first one there on the left, that's the one we tried in our usability trial. Second one, that, that was used, um, uh, that was the very first PZ that got us into market. And we then decided to make a single injection molded unit um, and we changed where the overflow was. So, and then the third re-engineered PZ is this one. And with this one, because of the, um, the higher male contamination rate, we've um, got a little hood in here, so the male first stream doesn't go straight into the bottle. There's a little one-way valve in here, and as you know, there are two outlets. So this is not just a funnel. It's a very highly engineered piece of kit that is designed to do exactly what, what it's designed to do. Um, if you have to help somebody use it, you can hold it in place without being invasive, and that's great for children, for the elderly, anyone disabled. I used to do it with my own mother. Um, and uh, so it, it, it removes all sorts of embarrassment for carers as well. Um, where are we going with PZ? Well, we're hoping to get it established more than it is here. We'd like it to use, uh, be used generically. There is a trial with the US military that started yesterday. Uh, with 2,000 patients. We're very much looking forward to that. We have another trial in the States at Loyola Medical School. Um, so we're determined to get this properly adopted so that patients can get treated right first time and Vincent's dream will come true. Um, we have also been ingratiating ourselves with the clinicians and we know that first dream is needed for a number of early stage cancer tests and we've, we've redesigned, well, we haven't redesigned, we've designed a PZ first stream. So we've effectively reverse engineered this with a narrow base. We collect what we currently discard and we get rid of the rest. Um, and that is, uh, that's um, subject of a grant application in conjunction with the Whittington who've, who need first stream for one of their, their new tests. Uh, PZ stool, no one likes collecting their poo. We've worked out how to do that in a much easier way in a flushable manner. Um, and sports dope testing, which is always in the news, uh, you need two um, samples of urine from the same urine stream. One gets frozen, and if there's any discrepancy over uh, the first one, that one gets, gets checked as well. We know how to do that because sports people have to do it in front of so They have to be watched. Um, now, if you've got this, at least you've got a little bit of dignity and privacy, um, and it's hygienic. And the sports person then has to pour their urine into two separate containers. Uh, they don't have to do that if we design our PZ detector. Um, so that's where we're going with all this. We want to build the specimen collection and make the world a better place. Thank you. Excellent. I look forward to having a PZ party. Uh, <laughs> I'll invite you next time. Um, Yesterday I was at a pig farm with chief medical officer looking at antimicrobial resistance, part of the One Health agenda. And the big ask from the farmers and the vets out there was all around diagnostics. And actually when you're talking about an equine sort of version, anything that makes things um, easier is certainly something that will be appreciated, I think, uh, out there. And then as I'm clearly getting grey and nearer that age where I'm going to start routinely uh, testing my stools, I'm looking forward for a peasy stool rather than having to do the other way, so it looks great. So our, our final speaker of the morning uh, is Professor uh, Trevor Williams, who was the former chief economist um, at Lloyd's. I've already been speaking lots about economists who've come and done a lot in this sort of field now, and he's visiting professor at um, the University of Derby, and he's going to be uh, talk about the dismal uh, economics of UK healthcare. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for the introduction. Uh, of course, I was wondering what an economist was doing here as well. Um, and listening to Giovanna, I was thinking, well, you know, this is easy peasy. Um, <laughs> I know, I know, it's, I don't know, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, Trevor Williams, yes. Um, so I, I 
part of what I was going to talk about was, in fact, the efficacy of uh, using the PZ. But I think that uh, my focus will, will be on that to some extent, but it will also be on the, the, the context within which all of this is occurring. You know, why do you need to improve productivity and efficiency and resource allocation? And the drive for this is immense. And so any innovation from within the NHS or outside the NHS which drives the availability of resources that are there for people to use is fantastic and absolutely uh, necessary and a huge imperative. Um, you know, they call economics the dismal science, which is why I thought I'd start with that phrase, <coughs> but it isn't all bad news because there, there is some good news amongst it. So here's some summary points. Innovation is required because the rate on, at which the demands on the NHS is growing means that it will rise to such a large share of GDP that it becomes virtually unaffordable and it will be in constant crisis. And these crises will have political ramifications. You saw during the election campaign just one move towards increasing costs on people that are using the care services, for example, led to a political uproar. Um, we have some big choices to make, in other words, about how health and social care is delivered. And it's about improving the allocation of resources. And I think that uh, PZ is one example of innovation which can demonstrably help across the NHS if it were to be adopted. But let me just give you a bit of background to some of the pressures that I've talked about. So between 1955 and 2015, the annual average increase in NHS spending per annum was 4.1%. You'll notice the peak uh, was around 59 uh, in the period of between 96 uh, and 2010. Since the financial crisis, it's dropped to 1%, austerity. And that is why there's a funding issue. It tells us what we need to know, which is that simply to stand still, the amount of resources which have to be dedicated to the NHS rises faster than the average growth in the economy as a whole. It means that we have to keep finding additional resources to be made available to it. And that is part of the logic of this, which is not very often understood, but you can see it graphically because you can see it spending rising as a share of GDP. And the recessionary period, you can see quite clearly, it stopped rising as rapidly as a share of GDP. And that in itself was enough to start to create a crisis. Here's partly why it's going up. So this is growth in age segments of the population. Split it into two. Split it between the working age population and split it between that and those that have retired. And you see how the pressure grows. So the working age population, those people who are taxed to provide the money and resources which are allocated to the NHS, will be declining as a share of total. Whereas the pensionable ages will be growing three times as fast in growth terms over the coming 15, 20 years. And what does that mean? Well, it clearly means that there's a 1% demographic effect on the UK's budget deficit every year. It adds 1%, which equates, by the way, to about 19 billion a year at current GDP levels. But GDP will grow. So the amount of cash it will be required will grow as well. The other point, of course, is this, which is that the cost of treating your average 30-year-old, across here, as you get older, the cost of tr treatment rises. So between, let's say, 60 and 80, it's around four times as much. By the time you get to around 80, 90, it's around eight to nine times as much. So the, the pressures on being able to allocate resources efficiently will only grow over time. And this is the key point, that in the UK, we're pretty efficient in international terms. And we're not so bad at the care that is offered to people. Death rates, if you look at it actually dispassionately, aren't great compared with some other countries. But the, the treatment that is offered for various illnesses is pretty good. And yet, GDP shares allocated to this category of NHS spending, or NHS spending as a whole, 
will virtually double over the period through 2066 of current demographic rates. Is it avoidable? No, it's not avoidable. The only way you can do this is to become more productive in the delivery of all of these services and more innovative um, and accepting change and organisational design and methodologies for delivering all the things that are required uh, to keep people healthy uh, as the increased population means that the average person has two or three illnesses, yet they continue to live to the average age now, which is about 82. So that in itself is what's leading to pressure. So clearly, PISA is an example, as Giovanni and others have shown, that keeping down retest rates is absolutely vitally important. And one of the reasons why PC is so important is because um, it reduces the retest rates and the contamination rates so dramatically compared with other devices. And even if the device is cheaper, it still uh, affords greater efficiency um, because the contamination rates uh, from uh, retesting are so much greater for even cheaper devices. The more expensive the device compared with PZ, uh, the more savings that there are from using it. Um, so the <coughs> savings are significant. Um, and those are just estimates of some of the direct costs, the indirect costs of illnesses that aren't properly evaluated, costs more in terms of people not being able to go to work, costs more in terms of later treatment, uh, because it's more serious and if it was properly tested the first time. I mean, all of those things come into play in indirect cost terms. And they're all clearly incredibly important. And this is one of the things as well to note about the way that some efficiencies can be made across the trusts that are in the NHS, which is that the average performance differs quite markedly between different trusts. So what we did here was just look at trust contamination rates um, across those that replied um, to the uh, questions that were sent to them, um, which was, what are your uh, contamination rates? And you can see the huge gap um, between Maidstone and Tunbridge Wells, not to pick on anyone, and North Devon. If you, took, if you averaged out these differences, then the savings in themselves would be quite, quite significant. And... Um, the significance of this is proven by the statistical analysis we did, which is just compare um, the uh, returns which you get uh, from having a lower retest rate. And it is highly significant. So huge savings can be made um, as a result of bringing them down towards the average. And just to illustrate the point I was making earlier, that even if the device is cheaper than the cost of the PZ collection system, like this one is, for example, it still works out that there's significant savings. And the reason, of course, is because the failure rates from using uh, this universal collection and container methodology leads to great, significantly greater retest rates than if you use the PZ. And so all of the analysis supports the conclusion, which is that this is a significant cost saving across the NHS if it was to be adopted universally. And it's also an example of the sort of innovation which is required in other ways across the NHS if we are to continue to deliver these things in a way that is affordable uh, in future. So um, with that, um, I'd like to draw a conclusion uh, to my contribution to this morning's events. I think we have some time for questions if there are any for me. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've had some uh, excellent talks this morning. So what we're going to do for this next session um, is I'm going to get the panel to briefly introduce themselves. I don't want your whole CV, just a one-liner of what you sort of do. Um, and then just give me a very quick thoughts about the product from either what you've seen or what you've used. And it has to be very short. We're talking one or two sentences, and not sentences of a five-year-old that have no grammar or punctuation in. Okay, so we're going to start at the far end. 
Yep. Okay. Um, I'm Alison Taylor and I'm an expert patient and I'm a member of QTIC, which stands for the Chronic Urinary Tract Infection Campaign, which was formed in January 2016. Um, in terms of the PZ, it improves patient dignity and actually it just makes common sense. I, you know, I think it should be adopted by the NHS and, and the private sector. Okay, I'm going to come back and quiz you a bit further as our expert patient. Okay, yes. next up. Okay. So I am Susanna Fraser, another expert patient from Bladder Health UK. Um, I'm a sufferer myself and I advise others who are sufferers. Uh, I think the PZ is an excellent device, much needed. Good morning, I'm Rachel Cashman. I've had a 20-year career working both in supplying of um, goods to the NHS, then in the Department of Health devising the policies around using goods in the NHS, as a National Commissioner at NHS England, uh, creating uh, the infrastructure for the use of innovation, and more recently on the board of a number of NHS trusts, making the decisions around financial decisions of which innovations to use and not use. And whilst I agree um, wholeheartedly that we should adopt PZ in the NHS, I think there's three things that we should think about, which I would characterise as the reading, the writing, and the arithmetic. So how do we read the uh, culture <coughs> of the NHS to increase usage of PZ? How do we read the politics, the policies, and the practice across the NHS? How do we then write the most effective strategic narrative to increase utilisation? And then how do we use the evidence that we've seen generated this morning to do the sums, do the maths, and make it a cost-effective must-do in the system. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Giovanna Forte, CEO of Forte Medical, the driver and the engine room. Um, Michael Adamczyk, I'm a special <coughs> gynaecologist. What do I think of PESI? I think it's a, a really, really good design. It's user-friendly and physician-friendly, and I think it has a future in medicine. Uh, Michelle Jai, I'm also an obstetrician gynaecologist. Um, I think it's very innovative and I do spend my life with black women and I think it's got a place. Um, I'm on the front line every day and I have no doubt that it, you know, it will have a place but it's just getting politics and you know, the economics right and improving it. Um, talk about the economics, Trevor Williams. And uh, so the evidence I gave is compelling I think, um, not just because the device has its own merits, uh, but also the backdrop to which it's been developed and the need to have not just this device, which is fantastic, but other devices and other methodologies to effectively provide the care that an ageing population requires in an affordable way. Hi, I'm um, Daniel Gosling. I'm an Associate Director with Arden and Gem Commissioning Support Unit, and I'm currently placed with NHS England in the Medicines, Diagnostics and Personalised Medicine Policy Unit, um, and I'm working with them to establish their strategic approach to diagnostics, um, which is why I'm here today, and I think this is very interesting. Um, and for me, I guess um, one of the most um, compelling arguments that we might make today is about um, value and how um, we take a diagnostics modality and we think about that in terms of the spend on medicines and how those two very big chunks of change in the NHS come together better and we have a, a more effective way of, of using those two um, services. Hello, I'm Louise De Winter. I'm the Chief Executive of the Urology Foundation, and we're a charity that fund research, training, and education in all urological disease. And our big thing is about making sure that we get proper, good, effective patient treatment and care to the patient. So we're always looking for areas where that treatment pathway can be improved, um, where we can get best diagnostics for the patient, so that's our interest in this area. It seems to me criminal that we are wasting so much time and money on bad, um, bad sample collection and bad readings and things needing to be done again. And that has a knock-on effect for the patient, let alone the NHS. Right, my name is uh, Frank Chinagundo. I'm a consultant a urologist at, uh, at Bart's Health NHS Trust. Uh, I see a great many uh, women with uh, urinary tract infections or in fact those with suspected infections and it's a it's a, a source of frustration that the 
that uh, it's difficult to make the, a diagnosis if the sample hasn't been collected properly in the first place. So I'm just interested in getting it right first time. Okay, super. Right, lots of positive things there. So, audience, this is your chance to grill them, the people who've made presentations or ask questions in the, a question time. If you do want to ask an individual, then you can just say. But if you just say your name and where you're from, that would actually sort of help. Um, anyone got any questions? <laughs> Gentleman here. Okay, so I'm Carter, I'm a urologist, uh, um, and uh, I work in the management of uh, men and women with urinary, urinary tract infections. Um, I think that the really critical issue in that pathway is the role of lipstick testing. So in, in, the reality is that if that was better done in practice throughout the country, and I think it's difficult to do well, because, partly because the sticks and so forth, there would be far fewer MSUs to be sent. And I wonder whether there is a way that you could integrate the algorithms that you are <coughs> using for the PZ with the uh, you better and more effective use of dipstick training. And, and it's probably interesting for general practitioners to speak about that, because I think that that's where it's at. Do anyone want to comment on that? Those maybe in personalized care? Dan, thinking? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's a, um, anything that could be done to kind of um, increase the offer in this sense, I think would be very, very interesting. Um, and for me, it is that kind of reduction in the, in the, um, the instances where the, the, the sample has to go off to the lab, for example, would, would be beneficial. Um, um. We are looking at developing a smart PZ. Uh, we're currently um, starting to speak with uh, the bioengineering people at Imperial. So we're looking at somehow integrating um, the means by which we can actually do point of care testing and then in the longer term develop that into more personalized medicine. Um, so work is underway. It will take some time, but bear with us. So the challenge I put back to this in is, and that's why you put on the, the Slack site to dip or not to dip, is, and we know that a lot of elderly patients are routinely colorized um, with uh, bacteria in their sort of urine, and it's very easy if you're working in a nursing home um, to dip it and then ring up a GP who's often distant and sort of say such and such has got a UTI and put that sort of pressure on there. So my sort of challenge around all of these things is how do we make the sort of the, the smart technology work in a positive way that doesn't drive antibiotic prescribing? Um, on there. So, so, I mean, I think that's absolutely right, but it's, it's marked partly education, isn't it, around the use of dipsticks. So there's no, you know, ultimately, urinary tract infection is where you have an interaction between bacteria and the bladder wall. It isn't about the bacteria and the urine. So, if you don't have any evidence of white cells on, um, or, uh, on microscopy or by dipstick, the significance of that test is probably limited anyhow. So. <coughs> I mean, I think we all have to get smarter about, uh, and I mean, I think it's, you know, from the point of view of the NHS and antimicrobial resistance, that education seems to be missing, and I, I haven't seen the Slack website, and maybe I have answered all these questions, but I think there's just such a huge amount that can be done in common, and, and maybe PZ can be a driver for that change, which I think is uh, so uh, well needed. And I, I asked my general practitioner to make sure about this, <laughs> well, I don't actually do it myself, of course. It's my staff, my staff that do it. Well, I, I mean, I've gone through the process, like the training process on how to do a group dipstick test with the girls, and I think they're doing pretty well. The major problem with the dip is the dipsticks. I mean, how good are the dipsticks at, at um, how accurate are they? How many times do they miss, uh, uh, get false positive tests or false negative tests, etc.? They're very sensitive for blood. What are they like with 
red cells. What are they like for white cells and, and nitrites? And uh, if you can, you know, the smart peasy, if it can improve the accuracy of the dipstick testing, I do think that's, that's something that would be a massive advantage to your already very good product, in my opinion. study um, you know as a clinician we often rely on midwives to do the dipstick etc and actually I was you know dipping it myself and seeing it and uh, more 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 than several occasions there were staff you say oh there's protein let's send it for an MSU so there's a the lack of education mm -hmm. because they don't understand what it means they just send it and that's seven pounds 62 wasted again so it's very important. Okay, so education is a real sort of element on it. Just to come in here. Just to add that, so now that I am free from the shackles of being a civil servant and can, uh, can uh, freely speak my mind, my ask, I guess, of my ex-colleague Dan and the NHS England's diagnostic strategy would be how do we harness the education of the workforce in um, areas such as this in a way that is coherent? Because without being too political, we know since the Health and Social Care Act the fragmentation of the system has meant reaching the various stakeholders we need to to get that consistent message is really very hard. And the flip side in, in relation to PZ is, and particularly smart PZ, is there's a very strong story about manufacturing story, an innovative manufacturing story, from an idea that was uh, the genesis of which was from a GP in this country that hits every single political button if you want to get policy change. But without the cultural, educational change in the service that's required, then ultimately the policy ambition would fail. So it's... NHSI, you know, the whole central system working together around that cultural change to support NHS staff. Innovation, is it? 17. 17 years. Okay, come here. Question about innovation. Very interesting what you said. Thank you very much. Uh, my, my name's John Simpson. I'm the um, chief executive of another medical device company. We put our product through the NHS Innovation Accelerator, and it came out as being, I quote, by NHS England, a great innovation with clinical assessors being strongly supportive of it, very strongly supportive. It's now going through nice. Why on earth? does the NHS Innovation Accelerator not actually have a policy to really drive home innovation, which is why, uh, for example, um, Giovanna's product has, has taken so very long. The, the NHS seems to be very poor at adopting innovation, despite the extremely clever people working in it, and, and by that I mean not exclusively clinicians, but primarily. Let's pick up on this, because about the NIA, so the National yeah, Innovation Accelerator. We, we were actually turned down by the NIA. Uh, they said they couldn't see the patient benefit and they couldn't see the cost savings, and they have seen everything you've seen today. Right, okay, interesting. I am actually partly involved with the separate scheme. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just going back to the... Education point that Michelle made and that was touched upon here over here very interestingly, and I do think that in general practice we we can do a lot better with UTIs in general, and I think that um, the problem starts way before we get to the dipstick, and I've, I've never not done my own dipstick, and I've never not tested my own dipstick in surgery, but I think that the, and it's also the problem with this current shortage of GPs, so. People are being taken on, like, sort of, I'm not, I've got nothing against nurses at all, but it takes a lot of education to know how to take a history, because dipsticks are being done when a history hasn't been taken properly, and it's just totally unnecessary, so I do think that's, um, that's quite a, an important part of it. It's the history taking before you ever get to the dipstick, which is not as good as it could be. So a plea to all of you, then, is NICE will be sending out its common infection guideline for consultation on urinary tract infections, I imagine, in the next month. This is the opportunity to feed all those really important bits back in that pathway to make sure that the bits that you're highlighting are actually sort of picked up in there. And I think, like much of medicine, it's all in the history before you then start moving on to the, um, the other bits and pieces um, on there. Question at the back. 
Um, sorry, yeah, I'm a microbiologist at uh, Bart's Health, and we have a look for Frank at the device. Um, this is really only looking at the front end of the problem, as it were. So even if you, which is only really a small part of diagnosing your new tract infection, so even if you get a nice clean specimen, um, it still goes round the east end of London or whatever for a couple of days mm. before it gets to the lab. And then we do about five or 600 urines a day on a good day. So it's done epidemiologically. If you don't have more than 10 to the 5 E. coli in your urine, you don't have a urinary tract infection. Even though that's based on something that dates back to 1956 in pregnant uh, Caucasian college students or something by Ed Cass, we still use this ridiculous yeah. diagnostic criteria, yeah, which everyone admits is a load of rubbish. So even tidying up the front end, um, I mean, people always talk about personalized medicine and you know, smart this, smart that, and we must sequence everyone's genome. We can't even test a urine properly and reliably, uh, which would only cost a fiver to do it properly, as opposed to one pound 50 or something to do it badly. So I'm going to turn to Louise de Winter here, um, whose um, the Urology Foundation is all about investing in the sort of science. What is your ask of the Urology Foundation in terms of what research is, is needed to change or update this 1956 uh, based sort of pathway? Sorry, was that a question? Yeah, so I don't know if you... What do, we, what do we need to actually move on from where we are at the well, moment? I, I don't think it's rocket science. It's the fact that we are a production line, okay? So we, we think PZ is no good to us. It costs an extra quid. Go away, okay? So a new MRSA test costs £50. Pounds. It might save thousands of pounds to the NHS. But the way of the budgeting and everything works, and we had a bit touched on that earlier this morning, it, it's a completely irrational system. Um, so it isn't rocket science to do an accurate urine test, but it just costs a little bit more. And we're always being told someone else can do it cheaper, you know, someone else can do your cleaning cheaper in the hospital. So without that change of silo thinking and budgeting mentality, I don't think anything will change. Can I respond? Yeah. Um, well, firstly, I absolutely agree with you. It should, it's just basic. You know, we should be getting these things right first time, as Frank says. Um, I've been thinking about maybe do we need to have a Cochrane review into the cost of all of this, just to kind of lay down the groundwork and say, you know, this is an independent Cochrane-style review, so let's start from this base and see now what we need to do to... Um, you know, to kind of put some trials in progress, I suppose, really. Um, the other thing that we're doing slightly left field as, as a charity is we're funding a programme which is called Equip, and it's about building leaders and developing quality improvement programmes because every urologist knows that at some stage during your, pre your training you are going to have to do some kind of quality improvement programme at one of your rotations. And a lot of these quality improvement programmes actually probably sit there gathering dust once they've been done because actually it's the same problem. You know, where is the will for making sure these things are actually implemented and taken up? So we're looking at a project with, uh, project with psychological behaviourists as well at King's and urologists um, developing quality improvement programmes and leadership skills in trainees right from the ground up. We're, we're, we're piloting it in London, the South East and the North West training deaneries at present. But actually it's had some national interest now and BAUS are looking at whether they could take it up on a, on a sort of broader basis. Because it isn't just about having the bright ideas, we've all discovered, because there are billions of bright ideas out there. It's about actually how do we actually embed those ideas and make sure that there are people who are going to be responsible for taking them forward. I think there's, there's a kind of cultural inertia within the NHS, which is a product of the size of the NHS. I don't think it's to do with necessarily the quality of the people working in the NHS, because the NHS has some very bright and brilliant people working within it. It's just a, a, a product of you know, it being so huge, it's this massive tanker. And who is responsible? And it's very hard for people to take responsibility. And what we're trying to do is actually train that in from the beginning, train it in from the beginning, and make sure that actually everybody's involved, not just the trainees and the juniors and the consultants, but the nursing staff and the support staff as well. So, sorry, that was slightly left field, but actually that needs to happen. 
in conjunction with everything else. We need to have that happening to get anything adopted, I think. That lady on the end of it. I'm sure you'd hear me anyway. My name's Angela Kilmartin. 45 years ago, I started something called the You and I Club, which stood for urinary infection. I've written 12 books on this, government leaflets. I've got six booklets up in four languages on site, and I spend my days looking after women with urinary tract infections. Um, email came through to me during coffee. Hello, Angela. I've been suffering with bladder pain for the last 10 days after a bladder infection. Negative sample from the doctor, however. I am sure, 100% sure, it was an infection, as I've been plagued with them since the age of 16. I'm 32 now. After numerous scans, cameras, a dilatation, I have unfortunately lost faith in GPs and urologists. As I feel each time I present with symptoms, I am fobbed off and left to my own devices. I've made an appointment this morning for another referral to a specialist, and I would like to know if you have any advice that I should arm myself with before I go. I have your book and have been adopting the bottle washing procedure, but we've been trying to conceive, and so I haven't done it regularly. Any help you can provide would be much appreciated. Um, I am upset, upset and frustrated, and I can't see the end in sight. This was me 45 years ago and seven years of recurrent cystitis, a lost marriage, lost opera career, and I went on to do all the work that I have done, and I'm still not stopping, and I'm now 76, and I won't ever stop because the suffering is huge. I would like to say congratulations to Giovanna and her brother Vincent for the vast amount of work that you will have done on this, vast. When I founded my charity, it was vast work. It's continued to be vast work. But when you're in with a medical profession and you're trying to do all these um, tests and so forth, it's a huge amount of work. I could have asked a thousand questions, but of course I'm not going to do that. And I would like to just make a comment that urine samples are not just needed for U UTIs. And I could go on forever about insignificance and mixed growth because I believe the patient is responsible for that. Urine samples, though, as we've seen this morning, are needed for all types of illness, not just urology. And so I can see a use for your PZ, your easy PZ, in other types of illness. But in terms of recurrent urinary tract infections, I can see that you would have to let the patients have these at home. And if you were having to do that on regular amounts, it is going to be costly. And they are definitely not then doing any prevention work. And so I'm into prevention and self-help. And a little study that was done a long while ago um, with the Institute of Urology showed an 88% reduction in urinary tract infections when self-help and hygiene was employed. I'll shut up now. <laughs> I'll go to the end of the table then and ask our <laughs> expert patients about that view. And I, I think there is that big debate at the moment. There is. I, I, I think that um, the point the gentleman in the room makes is, is right about the actual testing itself. Um, at the moment, it's based on the criteria that, to our mind, is, is completely outdated. I'm sure my colleague here would agree with that. Um, I think we have to, I think PC is the start of this to make the samples more reliable as they go to the lab, but it goes on further than that because we have to have a, a testing system that is going to work and give, give women reliable results, not unreliable results, like, like Angela's lady um, who's come back to her saying that there was no, no infection present when she feels very definitely there was. That's a story I hear time after time after time on the phone at Bladder Health UK. Um, and I think to have a proper testing system in place that gives women reliable results is what's required. And that starts with PC, but goes a lot further. Can I make some yeah. comments? Um, thank you for bringing up the issues with the CAS criteria. I mean, the CAS criteria was never validated to diagnose lower urinary tract infections, um, and it's being used, and it shouldn't be. It was based on the theory that the bladder was sterile. New evidence is emerging that the bladder isn't sterile. Um, it was based on the assumption that UTIs were caused by one urinary pathogen. The latest evidence shows that it isn't, that there are polymicrobial infections, that 
pathogens in the bladder develop biofilms. Our, the, the patients that I represent, there are 500 of them, they were told repeatedly that they didn't have a urinary tract infection because they had um, samples that were coming back with mixed growth. Um, actually, they did have infections. They were polymicrobial infections. It took the patient on average six years to get a correct diagnosis. That is six years with having a constant urinary tract infection. Yeah. My daughter was one of them. She was three when she got her UTI. It took until, sorry, I'm getting emotional. It took until six until she was correctly diagnosed with a UTI. She was given the diagnosis of painful bladder syndrome. It was because I thought we had her urine culture for longer privately. It was finally diagnosed. Every single patient in the group <coughs> had exactly the same clinical history. They were misdiagnosed with painful bladder syndrome, interstitial cystitis, yeah. overactive bladder, until they finally got the correct diagnosis, had the correct and appropriate antibiotics, and most of those patients have made a full recovery. But that was six years of suffering. I'll come to Louise to come back on some of that. And then I'm going to turn to Frank as our urologist afterwards around some of the, actually, the bit we've just heard from Angela at the end about some of the difficult conversations that take place. But Louise first. Oh, yes, just a very brief comment about, the, you know, this, what we've heard, really underlines the need for there to be a proper set of standards um, <coughs> from source to slide. So both in the collection... Of, of the urine sample, but actually, when you're actually analysing it at the other end as well, happened to be speaking to a pathologist yesterday um, who said that, you know, she worked in a particular lab, and if there were slides that came from um, another hospital, which was so many miles away, they knew they'd be useless, mm -hmm. because by the time they'd actually got to their lab, they'd be, you know, full of whatever contaminants or whatever. Yeah. So they were automatically junking these slides that came from this particular place because they were no, no good to look at. I mean, what does that do for those poor patients in that, in that hospital who'd sent their slide? You know, this, is not, this should not be happening. We live in the 21st century. There's all sorts of ways now of dealing with things. We really need to get a grip and actually think about a proper set of standards so people know when they give a urine sample, they know it's going to be treated with, with respect and that it's going to actually be analysed properly at the other end. So I'm going to pick up Frank now, just to come back about the general things, because the um, urologists and I'm sure GPs probably feel like there's lots of pressure <coughs> by desperate patients who've lived with conditions for a long period of time <coughs> and don't feel like they're getting quite the answer they have. And on the other side, Frank probably has someone like me who's going, you're prescribing far too many antibiotics and we're seeing resistance increase. So he's in, a, he's in almost a lose-lose scenario about sort of what sort of happens. What do you do? <coughs> What's the yeah, advice, I think, I think for yeah. some of these patients who, who are at the end of their tether, I think? Well, I mean, it's hard to know where to start. Um, I think the uh, prevention aspect, uh, which uh, Angela touched on, is really, is really crucial and something that we don't educate um, patients of, um, enough about. And it's, in, it's an interesting observation in terms of urine infections. They're less common in certain segments of the population, which is probably related to how, of, how often they wash their perineums, particularly after passing a stool and, um, and prior to, uh, to uh, intercourse. So, th so there's a whole lot to be done in terms of education about prevention before you even reach the, 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 um, getting your, 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 your symptoms. And I think, I think the, the, the point that the microbiologist uh, colleague made about what happens to urine, assuming you've got it, you've collected it properly in the PZ device, there's a whole laborious pathway and storage in fridges and freezers and all sorts before it actually reaches a lab. So, it, so it's, it's no wonder that often the urine sample doesn't give us the, the, um, the correct results. And so, yes, it's quite true. We have lots of women who are told they haven't got urine infections, which is a, um, a result of the sampling and the storage and the, um, the um, analysis. So there is a lot to be done, and I would echo Louise's call for some sort of standardization of the, of the collection and the analysis of urine samples. <coughs> I mean, there are those who generally do not have urine infections and do have a painful bladder, 
um, but they're probably less in numbers than those that actually do have recurrent infections. Okay, There's good. much to be done. I'm going to pick up Daniel and then on to Trevor. So, Daniel, we just heard this whole thing saying the system for the diagnostics of urinary tract infections and probably all other things is still in the dark ages. Things take forever to get from um, GP practice or if a patient does at home to the GP practice, then finally over to the lab in whatever conditions. And then we get out our antique plates or bottles and hope they may grow something. What can we do about whole system change to um, improve what currently happens? That's a very good question. I'm not sure I have the answer. Um, I think what I would say is that um, it feels like we're in a good time and a good moment. Um, I think certainly the work that I'm involved in at NHS England, having spent sort of 18 months thinking quite, um, well, interrogating in quite a big way what we do about the medicine spend, you know, how we put in the right infrastructure to deliver some of the changes that um, have nationally set priorities around what we do about the kind of growing spend on medicine. Having set out, NHS England setting out a kind of a vision for personalised medicine, of thinking about the legacy arrangements for the 100,000 Genomes Project and how we kind of use all of those kind of next generation diagnostics. There's a gap in the middle really actually and it's a pretty big gap about well, how do we bring diagnostics up to where those things are in terms of the frameworks, optimization frameworks, in terms of an infrastructure to deliver any change, in terms of the right um, um, priorities for the system and most importantly in my mind the leadership you put behind that and how you establish that across both of the kind of NHS improvement and NHS and those national organisations, what they can do, and then how we kind of bring that down the system to affect some of the changes that we're talking about today. Because you have great innovations, you have great products, but there is a difficulty and lots of that when you sit at a nation nationally as well, how do you affect that change locally? Well, actually, the only way you do that is by setting the priorities, agreeing priorities, having the right infrastructure to, to, to influence, and then the big, other big gap is the data and information to make those cases to demonstrate the change. And what's kind of heartening about this, seeing some of the economics here, these are the very things that start to kind of actually get the attention. Um, but the trick is having the right priorities and delivering that through the system. So Trevor then, picking up, so your data um, showed on there about all the potential millions worth of savings and just before the tea break I said the rate determining step for this not being adopted rapidly is 10 pence for the current device versus 87 pence for, um, for PC multiplied by 65 million because that's how many we use a year. As an economist and your data, how, what do we need to get the NHS to, because we all think around this table this is a good device and we improve patient care, what do we need to do? How do we change it? Well, I mean, from the commentary from the experts that work within the, the system, you can see how difficult they find it to effect change. So I don't think there's any easy solution. Um, there clearly isn't. And, and I had all sorts of ideas uh, of, spinning around in my head when I was hearing some of the things being said about empowerment, for example, about listening to patients, about um, uh, the way that maybe uh, we should be able to use big data to prove things without necessarily having uh, to spend lots of um, money on, on research projects because it's, it's clear from the comment that was made at the back, for instance, why on earth are we using the 1956 system? Um, which is clearly wrong, everyone. It's, it, this is one of the amazing things of the economy. We know instances where markets are moving in the direction. We know it's wrong. We know it's unsustainable. And yet it continues to do it. It's about behaviours and the way human beings are. They won't necessarily change until there's a crisis and then that forces change. Um, it's about cost benefit analysis. I mean, an opportunity cost. And, and it's clearly wrong to force economy to, to equate, for example, what you did, which is to say this costs 87 pence, that costs 9p, therefore I'm going to use this one. No, no, no. Because what you're delivering is a better result from a test which will then reduce costs for everybody and pain and suffering and retail.
process and so forth. But so what you should have thought about was, I need to use the most effective way of delivering this. Our analysis showed quite clearly that the retest rates are far higher when you use a 9P product than when you use an 87P product. So why on earth would you use an 87, a 9P product when clearly the benefits are there to be seen? Um, but the way that you get that into the NHS, I think that it's, 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 it's going to be a, a task, isn't it? And, and okay. I'm going to pick up on the silo budgets in a moment. Rachel. Just um, so I just wanted to um, uh, amalgamate a few of the questions we've had into... Uh, and, I, and I was thinking about the, um, the, the financial flows across the system, which don't work currently in, for many areas, not just diagnostics. Fundamentally, though, um, this comes down to choice. And in part, that's political choice. In part, that is policy choice. And um, what Dan was, uh, was making the, the point about how we prioritise, how the system chooses to prioritise, and then how that is cascaded. And for me... A couple of the things that have not come out of this discussion yet is the direct correlation between an improved um, set of diagnostic standards and the outcomes, the explicit clinical outcomes for patients and how that would improve. Secondly, an improved diagnostic pathway and improved diagnostic standards and the explicit argument around the safety and experience for patients and how we tie that into national existing priorities like the National Sign-Up to Safety campaign, for example. Um, and in terms of the, the, the chap at the beginning around the, how, the, how does innovation flow, um, I was once uh, uh, told by a very senior person in the Department of Health, think about the NHS like Subway sandwich shops. So there's a common misnomer that the NHS is a single organisation where... Uh, a decision can be made at the top, you know, Simon Stevens or Jeremy Hunter, whoever, can make a decision and that will follow through logically. It just doesn't. The NHS, it, it, as an entity, is the lozenge, it's the logo. All of the organisations that sit within it have restricted autonomous powers and, uh, and boundaries. And we see time and time again the focus of what they do within those powers tends to be what are the immediate priorities. So at the moment, going into winter, it's A&E targets. Having sat on the board of a number of hospitals, all you can think about each day, you haven't got time to think about the latest innovation in com coming down a diagnostics pathway because it's so here and now. What we need the diagnostic strategy to do is create the political imperative so that the choice can be made to prioritise the diagnostic standard for the safety reasons, the clinical outcome <coughs> reasons, and the efficiency and productivity reasons. So one of the people put on the, the board the variation between Tunbridge and North Devon. So my challenge up back to the sort of the panel is we have in hospitals, so Lord Carter set up the model hospital dashboard, which was about trying to identify variability within the 200 odd um, sort of trusts that exist in there as a way of being publicly available. Actually, it's not, it's hidden by a very, pretty firm wall isn't it at the moment but data out there so you can actually compare how you're performing against your self-selected sort of peers do we know whether contamination rates actually sit on the Carter Model Hospital dashboard or should they? So my response would be I think they should and, I'm good, and um, given some of my team at the time were involved in the Carter work I'm not sure that they do because of some of the curtailments to the programme. One of, um, I think, I never like to go to a meeting without there being some very clear action, so an action from this meeting would be for the coalition of people at this table and in the audience to make very strong recommendations to Carter colleagues, um, the Getting It Right First Time colleagues in NHSI, Dan and his colleagues at NHS England, to ensure that that data is part of the Carter II <coughs> and the group of hospitals that are now um, going through that dashboard with the finance directors, not the medical directors, with the finance directors. And so and we're gonna, I'm going to come on to you just a moment. The second part is that, so you mentioned getting it right first time. Now, I'm not sure what sits in within the pathology services of getting it right first time. If you go onto the website, it just says it's coming, and I don't quite know at what level it's Tim coming. Tim Briggs is looking to appoint a microbiology lead at the moment, but he hasn't found somebody. Okay. That lady I just wanted to ask, um, I was very interested by what Angela said about the mixed growth and the fact that these mixed growth organisms could be UTIs, whereas so far, tradition, yeah, 
traditionally they've been sort of seen as contaminants. Um, so in fact, there is, there's a debate about what a contaminant is before we even publish that data. But I would just like, did you say there's a mic? I'm sorry, I haven't been uh, as maybe as, um, uh, I haven't been listening all the time as well as I should be. Do, is there a microbiologist here, did you say? <laughs> there is a microbiologist <laughs> here. So could yeah. just, the, yeah. hello. Sorry. Yeah, hi. So do you have any expertise in this subject that, I was just interested in what your view, interested in what your view was on, on um, mixed growth being treated now, um, you know, it being seen now commonly as, 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 a, as an, an, a true infection rather than uh, historically we've seen mixed growth with, you know, as, as, as a contaminant. So how do you... How, I know it's a big subject, but um, can you give us, throw some light on that to yeah, give I mean, us some advice I, as GPs? Sorry. I, I don't you I think to a certain extent, because you are doing so many hundreds of specimens um, a day, literally, it, it's not unreasonable to say mixed growth, please repeat, but it's when the thing happens two or three times and uh, you've talked to the patient and you're pretty sure that the specimen is being sent reliably, being collected reliably, is transported quickly, then you're entitled to ask for something more than a mixed growth. Please repeat, you know, send your patient to the psychiatrist or something. Um, ah, because right. you so, can so say... You, so you think that if the mixed growth comes back two or three times, you don't think that is evidence of an infection that needs to be treated with the antibiotics? No, I, I, th I think I'm <laughs> arguing for a much more individual approach. I, it's, not my so it's not my field of expertise. I'm just interested in how I should... I mean, about these situations. There's very good evidence that um, even 10 to the 2 instead of 10 to the 5 E. coli um, really cause um, urinary tract infections. And I'm, I'm just arguing that um, in the case of a mixed one, if you're getting the same bugs back again, then it's legitimate to treat it or think about it and not, and, and not dismiss it. Mm. As, and one, one point, the lab is at fault. It doesn't have the time to to um, specify what, what it was, that we just say mixed growth or scanty mixed growth. So you're saying that sometimes you should treat and sometimes you shouldn't based on the clinical picture? Yeah. Yeah. Because well, I mean, I, I've always basically treated, um, I've, always, oh, I've always thought that if antibiotics help, then there was an infection. But so often they don't help. Hmm. So often they don't. And, and in fact, I don't kind of, I don't quite go along with the, the fact that these people haven't, I mean, I think antibiotics have been given vastly and overly and they usually don't work actually so i'm surprised you you say that you know they haven't been tried because um i haven't seen uh, that in vary. the gp world so there's, there's yeah. a lot of evidence that started to come through recently uh, of trials of ibuprofen so in young females mm. uh, presenting um, with cystitis going on there that ibuprofen um, is as good as antibiotics and it's been repeated in UK and Germany, so there's a slightly different way. Was the lady, was your question to do with this? Uh, yes, it is. <coughs> sorry, 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 Michael. Oh, thank you. I'll come um, to you next. <coughs> yes, um, I'd like to talk as an expert, well, not an expert patient, but a patient, someone who suffered from chronic UTIs for over 30 years. I mean, I even took the time to go and see Angela, who was extremely helpful about 20 years ago. Now, I mean, one of the things that I'm finding, I'm also a member of QTIC along with Alison as well, is that um, with someone suffering from UTI, whether they be male, female, young or old, um, there, is such, there is such a diversity of information and education within the medical, um, you know, within the medical field that um, you know, there is still this teaching, I believe, in medical school about the fact that you're looking for single causal bacterium when you're looking for a UTI. Um, you know, a GP may, if the GP dips the urine stick, they may send it off, but if it's negative, you know, the patient is told to go away and do self-management courses. But if the patient is, is constantly going back to the GP, the GP is in a difficult place because NICE at the moment are not providing guidelines for chronic or recurrent infections. They've acknowledged it themselves. They're saying there is no evidence, and yet increasingly there is more evidence coming out now. I mean, Heightens, for example, earlier this year published a study in Belgium whereby you know, he did more advanced microbiology testing, PCR testing, and he said that um, in a cohort of about 200 women, over 20% of E. coli infections were missed. 
and also the other thing I think that needs to be acknowledged is if a, if a patient is coming to you and saying, I have an infection, I, you know, I don't feel well, and yet the results are still coming back negative or inconclusive, mixed growth, low growth, we know infections are polymicrobial, we still need to understand about the urinary microbiome and the vaginal microbiome, you know, some of that could be affecting the urinary tract. Um, I think we still also need to listen to patient symptoms as much as we do with regard to the testing. And what I'm hearing in this room is I'm hearing a groundswell as a patient of people saying, this can't go on any longer. Now, I may know a little bit more than most patients. Most patients will go to their GP or see a urologist and it's the man or the woman in the white coat. And so, therefore, you hope that you, know, you will get a conclusion to what's going on. But there's clearly in this room an acknowledgement of the fact that there's a problem. And I would hope, as, as Rachel said, that we gather up this momentum that's in this room and take it forward. Because as a patient, and obviously as Bladder Health UK have acknowledged as QTIC are currently campaigning for, change needs to be brought about. And yes, I know there's a financial implication to it, but you know the statistics globally for UTIs are increasing so significantly that we need to do something about it. And simply short course diagnosis of antibiotics or just take cranberry juice, that'll sort it out. <laughs> It won't happen anymore, sorry, it just yeah. it doesn't work. It's, I think it's very difficult. I don't know whether NICE are going to, to look at recurrent UTI. Certainly there's been Cochrane reviews that have shown antibiotics well, it was are effective up to House six Commons months. Well, it was raised in the last year. I mean, there was a specific yeah. question, and the Under Secretary said that she was going to take it further about this. Um, there was a specific question <coughs> raised about the problem with chronic UTIs. The, the problem with... Long-term yeah. But then normally on a prophylactic yeah. dosage, that's so, the problem. So one of the bits, and I think you'll find it on the Slack website, is a lot of work they have have done in Nottingham, where they've actually looked at uh, patient histories very carefully to try and understand uh, some of the, the reasons behind uh, recurrence of UTIs to almost sort of point the pathway to the right person rather than think, seeing antibiotics as the right thing. Is it to do with this question? Uh, you might just have to register. <laughs> Jump up the back. Uh, yeah, um, I'm Ashley O from Invivo. I've got a question um, uh, for Giovanna and um, uh, Rachel, I think. Um, it, it relates to momentum. Um, your meeting is being held at the same time as the Alphabet meeting in the States at the moment. Thank mm. you. And I think there they're talking a lot about um, value frameworks, value initiatives. Um, the partnership approach between industry and the other stakeholders in the system to get technology adopted. Um, and I'm wondering, they seem to be having success with all players except the, the, um, the payers. Um, and a lot of the impetus comes from the industry on this. They need um, a patient voice, which they say they think has been missing. But the, the initiative is inspired a lot by the industry. And I'm wondering how far in this country um, the industry has a bigger role to play in broadcasting the message about adoption of innovation uh, in the NHS and what you think the prospects for that might be? Well, we joined the Association of British Healthcare Industries about 18 months ago and well, I've learned that that association is, do, is, is set, setting about doing exactly that. Um, the majority of the ABHI membership, I think 70%, Andrew, you'll have to correct me, um, Andrew is from the ABHI, um, are SMEs. Um, and one thing I've, I've I responded, they're now setting up a proper SME group. Um, I completed a survey the other day and I said specifically that innovation and new ideas that come from those have to be communicated very specifically by the association. Um, and I have a feeling that, that that is likely to happen because they are actively working at um, creating that sort of, that facility, that conduit, if you like, to get the information out there. Um, but I think also SMEs are hidebound by cash flow, um, by the way they run the businesses and how easy it is to invest in communication. Um, I have a PR background, as people probably know, um, and so I understand how important that is. Um, and so I think we communicate reasonably effectively despite not having a Twitter hashtag. I hate Twitter. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it's very difficult for small companies to be able to afford to get that information across. 
So we do need help from the industry, and it's on its way. If I could just add to that. So when I was in the department, I had the joy of accompanying ministers to Alpha Med uh, several, uh, for a number of years. And um, it was a really interesting experience in the nature of the dialogue. And my plug for ABHI would be Peter Ellingworth, who's the chief executive of the ABHI, it is um, an absolute master at, um, at managing the relationships and punching, frankly, way above the, um, what has traditionally been the <coughs> device industry's weight uh, when compared specifically with pharma. So I used to work in the pharmaceutical industry, went into the department actually um, on a secondment initially on behalf of diagnostics, devices and pharmaceutical industries together. Um, which meant I got a real um, picture. Who shouts loudest wins in these things. So if you've got a big global company, um, they tend to dominate the policy spectrum. What ABHI have managed to do is lift up the SMEs to create a collective greater voice. Where I don't think we're, we're yet there is how that greater voice to government, then um, we have the teams of that collective voice shouting with impact at a local and regional level with those who are willing to listen. So it's how do we get that traction? We can use the academic health science networks to do part of that. Actually, I think we need to be um, penetrating the sustainability and transformation plan partnerships, particularly the finance directors networks, and particularly those that are designing the kind of transformation systems as where um, the medical device companies and particularly SMEs can support. It's really important that we recognize the contribution to the UK economy of those such as Forty Medical who are in the business of market creation and then ultimately market expansion for new innovations because that's something that's not always been recognised unless you're a, a big Pfizer or an MSD or a Johnson & Johnson. Okay, so I'm going to take one last question here because we, we're wrapping up a quarter past. Yeah. Maybe a... Uh, Um, looking at your data, Frank, I see that there's very good evidence that PZ reduces contamination with or reduces mixed growth rates. Now, if, mix, if some bladder infections are caused by mixed growth, by polymicrobial infections, which I'm afraid I've been out of practice for four years, um, retired early due to stroke, and uh, this is news to me, but it just got me thinking now. Um, if, if we reduce mixed growth, but people are still some people are getting infections. Maybe what we're doing is removing the actual contamination that is the actual mixed growth that is due to contamination. What's left behind may be your poly infection. So maybe PZ has a role in helping the people with chronic cystitis yeah. because we could increase yeah. the accuracy microbiologically of the specimens that are being collected and maybe uncovering, taking away the weeds to leave the actual flowers in, in, in the flower bed that you're trying to detect. I believe so. I'm just making a note. Okay, I can let you have one last final, final question. <laughs> Andrew Turner, I'm, I'm with Forte. Uh, I just wanted to make a point you said about Carter's model, pathology model. So Ca Carter's model, um, or, or pathology in the UK, draws around about 800 million bloods a year. Yeah, and they'll do that in a single uh, universal method. So they'll use a, a BD safety lock, which is the needle into your arm, and then they'll use a BD vacutainer. And that's a red top, blue top, yellow top, whatever. But it's the same method, straight onto the analyzer. So I guess my question or observation out to the wider audience is that, you know, when, and it chimes with the why a diagnostic standard is overdue, you know, when will your own analysis follow that, that yeah. model? I, I understand it's a slightly different way of drawing the specimen, mm -hmm. but I've worked with PZ now for a few months and I've been across the UK to many different community trusts hospitals, wards, and there are so many disparate methods from one litre gravy pots to um, uh, trays, I think somebody said a tray earlier on, and, and then it gets decanted and decanted and decanted. So there is really no chance of, of a, a, a universal method until that, that single process is mapped out. If we were Henry Ford now or Nokia, you know, that would be a fault on our production line and Mark's right, we're a production line in pathology. Um, so that, that has to be a key focus, perhaps, for the commissioners, NHS England, to, to fix. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up by asking... I've got a really quick question. What is the 
largest evaluation of the PZ? Where, which is the largest research that you've done on the cost-benefit analysis? Um, What's the so largest? Because all the studies are quite small. Yeah, they are quite small. Um, they're quite small because it's very difficult to recruit clinicians to do it because they don't have time. Um, Frank's uh, was, is 200, and that's ongoing. Um, the Pennine was 100. We ha we've had um, a study of 200 pa 250 patients at Stanford Medical School, and we know that we reduced their contamination by 45%. It was already very high. We're waiting for that to be published. And we have a trial of 2,000 that started yesterday in the US military, and that will be very detailed. And obviously, we'll let you know when that comes out. We have plenty, it's yes. Short, yes. Because that's, that's and, and, and very yeah. precise as to, you know, what is the cost benefit exactly? <clears throat> how much does it cost for a PC? How much does yeah. it cost? Yeah. We, how yes, we've got two documents that will do that. One's shorter than okay. the other. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, Giovanna, just to put you on the thing. So, you, I think you said. So, one paper has been published. Mm. Are there any other papers published? Not yet. Right. So, I would actually say, based upon one paper being published we you do need, need to do more. a bit more yeah we until do need you've more. actually got something in the um in the peer-reviewed press mm. and then find some jobbing person who I will do a I mean, analysis if, if there, on it if there are clinicians here uh, who are happy to do that i have to say we have um had 10 attempts at clinical trials um we've come across problems such as at medway where they finished the trial and then discovered that the lab had forgotten to log the PZ results. <laughs> we have had several instances of, of this kind of thing. It's a nightmare to try and get. So um, I would say perhaps after studies. the meeting, to speak to an expert, Louise, down here, perhaps on maybe there are opportunities. The other thing I might add so. is the very first um, clinical trial we wanted to do at Norfolk and Norwich, which was Vincent's territory, um, with Stuart Irving. Uh, went to a lot of time and trouble of his own to create a protocol. He got ethical approval and so forth. The R and, and this was for a cohort of 375 patients. R and D department wanted to charge us um, 135,000 pounds to run this study. Now I said, we're not Pfizer. We're an SME. This is designed by one of your doctors to save you money. Can you not do? You know? And they said, no. We're here to raise money for the trust. We got their costs, we broke them down to actual costs. The actual cost of that trial was £25,000. They marked up by over £100,000. So, and so this kind of thing that goes on prevents companies like mine So to one, of the, one of the opportunities, the MRC mm. are, are being helpful nowadays and they are looking at all the various funding streams that are out there to try and see how we can actually, and they will, I will see someone this afternoon actually, how you can try and move some of these things forward much more easily. So the days of actually saying, I want to sit down and spend months doing something, and then to have it rejected back, they are much more accommodating in having that early conversation to point you in, in the right type of direction with perhaps an NHS sponsor working that sort of yeah. SME, NHS well, The Field Trust are actually in Oxford. They're doing a quite a substantial primary care trial, and we know that's about halfway through. Okay. So. so that sounds very exciting. What I'm going to ask the, the panel to do is one action, because Rachel came up with this, you don't leave anywhere without an action. What are you going to do after this? We'll start at this end. <laughs> <laughs> He's a professor, he can think quickly. So, um, I think at Bart's Health try and finish the study and get to the 200 patients to get more numbers and having done that, uh, aim for a publication. Um, from our point of view as a charity, I think we'd probably be looking at um, maybe a bit of lobbying around getting some standards put in place because we feel that's so important in terms of the end patient benefit. Um, I'm going to go back and take a look at what's on the model hospital metric. Uh, well, I'm hopefully going to continue to pursue the angle of uh, incremental change is important, standardisation is important, uh, and the relevance of innovation to deliver health service more effectively in the future. 
Um, my would be similar to Prof's, would be to complete a trial and chase after pregnant women for urine sample. Mm. And also I think to educate our department as a whole at the point of induction I think is a very good measure to take part. Yeah, exactly as Michelle said, education um, to patients and clinicians. Um, I'm just going to carry on making this happen. The list is too long. <laughs> and as cross-sectoral networks are my thing, I'm going to try and pull together um, some thoughts about how we can get a collaboration of action and exert some influence across the system um, in relation to creating the standard. <coughs> We will continue to push for a change to the current standard of testing in the UK, um, which we hope will bring about a bit of huge benefit for women. And men. Ditto what Susanna said, but also um, I will personally recommend the PZ to doctors and urologists and geriatricians that mm -hmm. I work with. It's I've used the device myself on my children, one of whom is disabled, and it's been invaluable. Okay. And I'm... As, um, I know my sister very well. You've all given action points. She will be following you up. <laughs> <laughs> and it's on film. <laughs> and I'm going to the high-level steering group this afternoon of the Diagnostics AMR strategy. So I will be talking to somebody about what we can do about that pathway you, about that. urine testing because uh, I think it's important. Uh, so I said I'd try and sort of sum up. I think we've had a range of um, fascinating um, sort of talks um, from some of the clinical users who've been trying um, PZ um, in um, obstetrics and in urology. Um, I think we've seen a bit of the some of the economics around some of the, the, the retest type of um, work sort of going on there. Um, we've um, had a bit of me telling you what potentially uh, we could run into some problems with sort of uh, AMR. And I think other bits which have been really important, I made some notes on here, there have been some of the questions and the discussion from the audience have been really important, which is around some of the, uh, some of the models for value for money, uh, whether it's getting it right first time and what pathology are doing, the Carter model hospital metrics. We didn't even discuss uh, sustainability and transformation plans, trying to save that 30 billion uh, by 2021, because the current system's unaffordable, um, sort of in there. I picked up some things on recurrent UTIs and that we must have something that's clear out there to support patients, GPs, and the hospital specialists who work in that type of area. Uh, there was something also around there about um, not understanding the pathways and being clearer about polymicrobial infections, and that sort of debate about is it contamination or is it truly uh, polymicrobial on there. Something about a diagnostics overhaul, I think, which is which is really needed, and there is the pathology transformation program currently going on at the moment. And I'm all in favour of seeing standardisation of what we've got um, sort of on there. Um, I think there's something about almost patient information, which seems to be in millions of different places at the moment, and there is something about actually how do you have a portal that maybe sort of points <coughs> patients with different sort of needs in the various areas. Um, I think there's something brought about small uh, and medium enterprises and the help to actually try and sort of get um, with devices. So in the world of pharma, people have startups, it's worth a lot of money, one of the big boys come in and then they buy it up as a way of sort of doing it. And there is something that Dan picked up, which is we have to move in the same sort of medicines value program to do with drugs into something with devices, which is there. And the challenge is to you who are doing these things, until you come up with some credible evidence, you're not gonna get where it is in the pharma world, but you're doing this on a minuscule budget. So there is a, a challenge there for us, I think. Um, and that, they, were, they were my sort of real elements, and I've really enjoyed this. So I'm new to PZ um, on this, I'm, and um, I will go away and talk to some of the um, the farming community, so Rumour, who we were with yesterday, responsible use of medicine as animals, and they were 
desperate to try and improve things. So I'd like to think, thank all the speakers for their sort of contribution um, in here. And I'd really like to thank the audience. You were really a great audience for sort of interacting. This could have been pretty dry. And I'm sure over sandwiches, you'll continue the debate, hopefully. Thank you very much. Philip, thank you very much.